Okay, we're ready to go. Uh, first paper in this session is by Bob Clark. Uh, Melinda's not here, is she? Melinda's not here now. It's co-author Melinda Mor Morrill, uh, but she's not here. So Bob's going to present the paper. Orly Ashenfelter is going to be the discussant. Thank you, John. About a year and a half ago, uh, John and I and Tom Cruise were sitting around a hotel in Reykjavik, Iceland. And uh, Tom was a little distracted about his new movie, Oblivion, which I think is now in Oblivion, and maybe a few other personal events that were going on. But John and I started talking about this kind of conference at that meeting, and then a few months later, uh, John was making his application to uh, Kathleen and the Sloan Foundation, and then he got the funding, and he picked the people, and he, all, of course, picked all of you folks, so that's great. Uh, and so we've been thinking about this, and, and when I talked with John, he was pitching his 30 and 40, and I said, don't forget about employers. And so I volunteered to prepare this paper that is looking at the employer perspective of delaying uh, work life. Um, it is a paper that is without numbers, so we don't have any new numbers to think about. We don't have any new uh, uh, econometric estimation to think about, but we do have some concepts to think about. And if you look at the paper, there's a long list of uh, references in there on the various points that we're looking at. Uh, as we think about what is going on here, it's basically that uh, life expectancy is increasing, and the conference theme is that people will want to share that life expectancy gain in between extra years of leisure and extra years of uh, work. And what we need to think about is that there are really three players or three agents in this market. Uh, one are the individuals, and we might think that their preferences are pretty clear about wanting to work longer. Governments that are financing some of these programs might think that extra years of work and tax paying and fewer years of benefits is a good deal. Uh, for employers, it's the demand for labor as a key input in the production process and how they manage that. Uh, so from a, this life cycle perspective, you've heard lots of people say more years of life expectancy, more years of work. But guess what? If we look historically across the 20th century, we would find uh, the first part of the 20th century, life expectancy was going up and people were working uh, less, not longer. And if you remember Mike Hurd's uh, notes uh, where he did his uh, projection there, he started in 1990. If he had gone back and said 1950 to 1990, he wouldn't have gotten his two-thirds for each year. He would have got a negative number, and that negative number might have been close to one almost uh, as things were uh, declining there. And so his explanation, if you remember, was economic incentives came into play, and that was driving it. And then you may remember that Gary Burtless said, well, what about income effects? He put it in the terms of women working, but basically it is greater income, and we believe as economists that income effects might say as income goes up, you tend to work less, and these two driving forces. So if we had this conference uh, 20 years ago, it would have been show me where, anywhere in the world really, greater life expectancy was leading to longer work life. And I don't think you could have done it then. So again, uh, we've already mentioned uh, the individual side, but just a couple of points that are going to show up in the rest of the talk is what is it that we mean by wanting to work longer? And is it desire to remain on the career job with the same wage and compensation that you've had all your life? Or is it a desire to enter some sort of phased retirement where you work less and presumably are compensated less? Is it a desire to move jobs to some other less stressful, less physically demanding job for shorter hours? Uh, from the perspective of most of what I'm going to say today, I'm going to look at it from the employer's perspective on uh, item number one there. How are employers likely to respond to workers wanting to work longer on the same job for the, basically the same compensation under the same working conditions? And we've already talked about governments and where they might be on this, and many of the uh, discussion uh, earlier today and yesterday has been on this issue. So the players and the preferences, we haven't said a lot about employers. We've had some comments, and so toward the end of uh, 
uh, Alicia's paper yesterday, the discussion there was some discussion on the comment side about this. I do want to say that this is not a lump of labor paper. I'm not a vampire trying to get out of that coffin that has been nailed shut, but I'm trying to bring into the notion basic microeconomics as we think about labor demand from the standpoint of the employer. So employers have objectives of their own. They're trying to hire the right people, get them there. So you think about an employer, you want the right number of people, and you also want the right mix of people. And in that world of the right mix as well as the right number, our uh, employer is going to be willing to accommodate a later workforce, later uh, staying workforce, or will they try to offset that as workers demand or seek to, ha uh, to stay on the job for a longer period of time? Certainly employers have levers that they can pull to try to encourage people to leave. Will they use those levers or will they basically say, let the people stay as long as they, as they want under current conditions? Uh, the, the structure of the paper really is, <clears throat> I'm going to argue about optimal size and age structure of the labor force. I'm going to uh, try to get us to think about total compensation, not just wages, and we think about compensation relative to productivity. Uh, I'm going to try to get us to think about younger workers thinking, do they want to come to this job, this uh, employer, if conditions change so that people stay longer, um, <clears throat> and just this notion of if workers stay longer, will that make these jobs more desirable or less desirable to entering workers? Age structure. And so for a long time, in a lot of different ways, I thought about the notion of an optimal age structure of a population. What, what is the reason why a company would think about different kinds of workers as opposed to just a particular generic homogeneous worker? It doesn't matter what age, age they are. Uh, and I think it does matter. And the argument that I'm going to make is that older workers are different than younger workers. Older workers are different. Doesn't mean that they're better. Doesn't mean that they're worse. It just means that they're different. So younger workers bring different skill sets and different vintage human capitals. Older workers have experiences that younger workers don't have. And how do you put those things together to have that optimal age structure uh, of the firm? If worker, younger workers are different than older workers, then what we're really talking about is what's the elasticity of substitution of young for old workers? How substitutable are they? If they're infinitely substitutable, then there's no such thing as an optimal age structure. If they're different and they have different relative prices, then companies are going to have a desire to have different uh, age, uh, a particular age structure, and they're going to try to maintain it. And if you think about it from a human resource management perspective, the companies are going to put together their compensation package to achieve that age structure. They're going to put together the compensation that will attract the right number of younger workers, retain the right number of workers, and ultimately retire the right number of workers. And as the world changes, they may modify that optimal age structure as well. All right. so. Just uh, for a quick snapshot here, we'll do a delayed retirement parable. And so if you want to pick a random firm, let's just call it Leland Incorporated. Uh, and it has a production function that has capital and then three types of labor. Uh, and the first type of labor we'll call LJ. Uh, and these could be young Johnnies, right out of school. Greatest hot new technology know everything about what has been taught in the best universities or the best uh, craft schools or whatever. The middle uh, worker would be, we'll call them mature uh, Brighton, Brighton, say that, Brighton, uh, gaining experience and skills. And then finally, we have the older chauvins out there. <laughs> and these older chauvins uh, have considerable experience. And you know, we could ask a random person, like our organizer, you know, does he do the same set of skill sets he does today as when he was right out of graduate school? And if we think about this then, let's take our CEO of Leland, we'll call him Stanford, and Stanford determines the optimal number of people, and he also develops this age structure that he wants, and he sets up the compensation in order to achieve that. 
Now all of a sudden, we're running along, everything is fine, we've got the optimal age structure, uh, we're hiring new workers and they're retiring at exactly the rates we want them to, uh, and now all of these uh, uh, chauvins decide to stay on. Now remember we're talking about an increase in lots of chauvins, not one chauvin. And so the idea is more and more chauvins want to work longer and longer periods of time, and don't worry about a vampire here, but given a fixed set of age uh, of demand for labor, unless you're going to argue that the overall production, uh, production possibilities and the ability to sell their product of Leland Incorporated is going to go up, you don't really want more workers at this point. Now, if you want to put this in a dynamic model and let there be uh, economic growth, we can do that too. We can talk about all those things. But basically here we're talking about now a change in the desire based on current conditions for these workers to stay. So in an effort to restore that optimal age structure, uh, Leland Incorporated and Stanford as its CEO might try to decide new, new retirement policies. And so they may be able to decide on early retirement options and to try to reachieve that production, uh, that labor force. So do organizations really care about the age structure of their firms? A lot of the discussion over the last day and a half has been, no, we don't even mention age structure. We just mentioned number of workers. We had that nice little box about people coming in and people going out, and we didn't worry about anything. And I'm saying, maybe we ought to worry about this. And lo and behold, if we go from our hypothetical Leland to a real university called Stanford, we can see what's happened. And so this is from an article that I found by searching a little bit to do this, and says, nobody wants to leave Stanford. And I assume maybe that's true. Hoping to create more space for its younger scholars, Stanford has revamped an already generous policy in trying to nudge, does that say old timers, John? Old timers toward the door. And surely they've done that. And here is the provost saying, our senior faculty are wonderful. He's not saying they're bad workers, he's saying they're great workers. But he still wants to get rid of them in order to hire new workers. And even this last one down here says, if young generations don't see advancement, they might not even come to Stanford. So it's that uh, making about three points that I was making earlier in this nice statement here. I Googled, but I couldn't quite find it. But my guess is if I'd worked really hard, I could have found a statement like that from John Chauvin when he was dean. <laughs> Want to fess up, John? No? OK. So and of course, if you're interested in uh, academic, <laughs> there you go. If you're interested in labor uh, in uh, higher education, of course, you can't go anywhere without a quote from uh, Larry Summers. And you get the same thing here. So age structure matters because workers aren't equally substitutable. Uh, certainly in a college faculty, we can make a lot of sense out of that. It's where we, many of us live and work. And so we see the difference in what a young professor might be doing versus a middle-aged professor. There's mentoring, there's training, there's all those service committees, and everything else that goes on. And people just do different things and have different uh, uh, comparative advantages in that. So they're not the same kind of workers. And a university, just like a company, would want uh, a mix. A mix. Now, for those of us that are labor economists, and if you've uh, been reading uh, labor economics and human capital theory over a long period of time, you know the difference between spot markets and long-term markets. Uh, spot markets basically are just saying that people are paid their productivity at every point in time, and that's all well and good. And then if you're saying that, in addition to saying people are uh, different, then you changes in relative wages between young and old, you could re-optimize your labor force by making certain conditions there. And the long-term contracting literature, uh, you know, spawned by Eddie Lazier and a few other folks, uh, it would basically be saying, you tilt the age earnings profile relative to the age productivity profile, and you need an end of the contract. And previously, that end of contract was mandatory retirement. Then it was DB pension plans. And now, if we're entering this world where people don't want to retire, how do you keep a long-term contract? How do you make it work? Uh, I've done some work in Japan, and I can tell you that when 
mandatory retirement was increased in Japan, the age earnings profile tilted down because the end date had been tilted out. So it's not saying that contracts can't be adjusted. It's just saying, well, if they aren't adjusted, it's a different world than if they are adjusted in terms of comparing compensation and, and productivity. And remember, it's not just cash, of course, it is also total compensation that we need to worry about. And so uh, in today's world in the United States, healthcare costs matter, pension plan costs matter, things like vacation days matter, because many of those things are related to how long you've been on the job. And so, you know, it's amazing if you think about it, how much we pay people not to work in the United States. I mean, it's obviously a lot less than other, other places, but if you add up vacation time and uh, sick leave and compensation time and all those other things, you get to a pretty big number in terms of the por proportion of total compensation going for days not worked. Uh, and if they are all linked to, to uh, age, or years of service really is what they're linked to, uh, then it might say that, be careful, don't just, you can't just compare wage to productivity, you need to pair, compare total compensation uh, to productivity. Again, labor markets can adjust, which gets us back to that slide way back at the beginning where I said, what's the new world gonna look like as people try to work longer? Are they going to want the same job under the same working conditions at the same salary? Or can you think of the company modifying the working conditions, modifying the salaries, modifying the span of control? Or are they going to be sued every time they try to do that for age discrimination? This notion of promotional prospects, someone mentioned it a bit yesterday. Uh, if you do, if you, if we, had, if we have any real demographers in here? You no, know, some real demographers. So in the real demographers, they do all these nice uh, population uh, models and they change them with rates of growth of fertility and uh, life expectancy and things like that. And one of the, the uh, leading demographers uh, over the last, uh, I guess, 50 years, Nathan Kiefitz, wrote a paper a number of years ago uh, looking at aging of the population and rate of movement up the uh, employment hierarchy. And it's just pretty clear to show that if you extend working life and people stay on the same tracks, that younger folks are gonna to get to every position along the way a little bit slower. And so the point that I make here is just, suppose that's true, older workers are gonna like that, especially if you put it in while they're there as older ages. But if you were a new worker or a new academic, as we wanted to go back and quote the Stanford Provost, does that make this job more or less desirable? They will benefit from being able to work longer, but it's gonna take them longer to get to every hurdle along the way. Again, changing the working conditions gets you to the point where you can say, um, if we move to something like phased retirement, and I don't know if you know it, I suspect many of you do, phased retirement is really the rage in higher education. Most universities have some form of higher education, and for us it works pretty well. You can say do half-time work for half-time pay, and if you know, you've got two uh, senior professors and they're both making about the same, you can hire, go out and maybe hire a younger worker. Academic is sort of funny, we pay all these young folks a lot of money relative to uh, hard-working older guys, but um, phased retirement means that you can put this together in a different way, and every two that go into phased retirement, in a sense, is gonna open up a position. Again, I don't wanna be called that lump of labor guy, but it does open up a position, at least in academic, this is very clear what's going on here. And phased retirement works well. You can have a semester off and a semester on, whatever you wanna do. Uh, and I really think it's a win-win for both the university and the worker because it lets them transition out. The university always requires people to sign away tenure as part of the deal. So if you're transitioning out, here's a new way. And the, what, 2006 Pension Protection Act made it a little bit easier to introduce phased retirement and link that to pension payments. And so maybe this is gonna be a bigger deal across the country and other jobs. Uh, most universities, as I say, have already adopted these plans. They seem to be, at least at my place, very um, desirable from the worker standpoint. And so we see readjustments going on there as a possibility. 
And certainly, the government, if they wanted to help companies adjust, could do this, and there are a variety of ways. Um, so you could say once, whatever the normal, full, whatever we're going to call that in the future, age for Social Security is, you could say, well, after you've reached that age, workers don't have to pay, companies and workers don't have to pay payroll, pay payroll taxes on that. And if that were true, you all of a sudden cut the cost of hiring an older worker from the company standpoint by 7.5% more or less. And you could then go back to where we were once upon a time. And you could say that Medicare is the primary payer for workers as well as retirees over age 65. Uh, those, put all those things together and you know, you're probably reducing the cost of an older worker by 10 to 15%. Of course, that's shifting costs to the government, which we say are worried about the government having any money. But things could be done by the government to facilitate this or make it easier for uh, companies uh, to do this. And again, trying to avoid being a vampire here, labor markets are dynamic. They can change. Companies can change their policies. Relative wages can adjust. So if older workers are high cost relative to their productivity, and now they're, we're going past that contract at the end, we can revise the contracts, as long as the government lets us do that, and make older workers uh, more desirable uh, for, uh, from the company's standpoint. So I just come back to this notion that what we didn't say in our two days together is, it's not just one worker, or one type of worker, many types of workers, young and old are different, and maybe there are other groups, obviously, that are different as well. But because of differences in vintages of human capital and experience, workers do different things at different points in their lifetime. And that leads me to this notion of an optimal age structure. I've thought about this a lot over the years, and if you look in the papers, there are these random papers that I've written uh, on pieces of the puzzle, uh, but uh, I think there's still a, a lot one can do on optimal age structure need to take into account the, the degree of substitutability. How different are they? What are the relative costs? And how these choice, uh, costs and productivities might change over time. Um, and governments can facilitate that. And also individuals, the real question from the individual standpoint is what kind of work-life extension do they want? And how is that going to affect uh, company uh, and employer cost decisions? Thank you. And I'm not sure how many comments I have to make about it. I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I think is sort of the structure of what the paper is and, and uh, maybe make a few comments about that structure. Um, it, actually, recently I've been paying a little more attention to what, uh, how much people worked and, uh, and how much they were paid in ancient days. There's a very kind of a, a, a literature in economic history now. Many, much, much of it is by a, kind of accidental examples um, of uh, trying to measure real wage rates. That's sort of what you can purchase with an hour of work uh, and hours of work uh, at different times in the history of, of uh, civilization. We're dating it in back to the Romans. Uh, Diocletian had wage and price control, so there are actually some measures. And there's a kind of a, an active little controversy about what the real wage rate of an, a Roman worker was. Um, but until around, I think it's generally agreed, until around 1800, um, Malthus and the rest who thought that um, wage rates would always be more or less stable, Ricardo, um, everywhere and at all times were pretty much right. There was no real wage growth in the world until about 1900, 1800, sorry. Uh, and then, of course, the, the countries have all diverged. So China is still, the guy who makes your iPhone makes $1.80 an hour. Um, and they, that used to be 90 cents, but so it's grown. But it's diverged since that time. But basically, back in those days, um, everybody in the world made the same if they were a worker. Real, real wealth all came from property. Um, and hours of work were from sunup to sundown, one day off typically for your religious services, and you worked until you died. That was life. 
so this, none of these issues ever really came up. Uh, I'm always surprised when economists think that people work today as hard as they did. You know, the kind of non-market time and washing the clothes. And hours of work in the United States in, in, in the turn of the century before last, uh, 1900, were about 60 hours a week. Uh, you know what they are? That guy working doing the iPhone? 55. China is about where we were in, in, in 1900. Um, so it's a very interesting subject when you think about it more broadly because th this is a, an incredible opportunity, the idea of retiring. Totally modern in the history of the world. No one ever retired in the past. You worked until you died. You didn't, there were no vacations. You took a day off, a week, that's it. So in a sense, we're like uh, in an opulent, totally opulent environment. And we're not only opulent in the sense of the history of the world, we're opulent in, in us. This is not an option that most people in the world have. Chinese and Indians don't have this option. So we are like talking about, in a way, we're talking about a very small group of people in a small moment in the history of the world. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that people have a hard time get, get selling this topic, in a way. Um, because uh, they, what, the, what the paper starts with is ask the question, uh, why should we have any interest in um, longer working time for uh, workers? And there are a couple of answers, but they're not really very satisfactory. It's not obvious why that is true. I used to always, uh, I used to always rationalize uh, that I wasn't, uh, that I was uh, in, the, in the middle of the distribution of the way people were by saying that, uh, which is true incidentally, that, that I'm younger than Harrison Ford, uh, which, which is true. I, I know you don't believe it. You, I don't look it. Actually, I'm starting to look it. <laughs> and that, that's the message. There was a time when Harrison Ford was Raiders of the Lost Ark. And when I'd say that, people would say, wow, well, you're pretty hip then. But I don't know if you've seen his most recent roles. Uh, he, he's playing uh, in 42. He plays an old geezer with a pop belly like mine. Uh, so he, he no longer has that cachet. He's not the hot young thing. Um, and, you know, let's face it, his career is torpedoing as we speak. I mean, it's going down the tubes. No one is interested in old people. Um, and, uh, as you, well, last night we heard people being, we were being riffed on, right? <laughs> we're a bunch of stingy bastards. Uh, so I, I, think, <laughs> I think it's kind of hard, really, to rationalize. One argument is uh, working longer is, uh, is a nice thing because uh, it'll help with Social Security benefits. Well, Gary Bertolt has put the kibosh on that. It's not going to do much good at all. Uh, you have to cut their benefits. They have to stop taking them, or, or you have to cut them in order to have any effect. And, and the other is that maybe workers um, are being hindered from doing what they want to do. Somehow they want to work longer, but they can't. Um, I I'm, I'm, must admit I'm a little dubious about this, uh, but uh, I, I'm perfectly willing to be convinced. Um, I say I'm dubious because uh, there have been, through my life anyway, there have been all kinds of laws introduced to ameliorate what are considered problems in the labor market, especially with respect to the way people are treated. So I was actually a graduate student at the time the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. And, uh, and, uh, and I was around when the Age Discrimination Act was passed. Now, frankly, there were many economists, including myself, who thought that there were really strong arguments for the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the, the Title VII, which covers employment. Because a lot of us, uh, even, even some of the old timers in Chicago have been convinced of this now, thought there were differences in pay or other remuneration by race and sex. But I never, no one ever established that there was a problem with age. That was the Congress that made that up. There's never been any good evidence that people are discriminating against based on age. That was not to remedy a problem, perceived problem. That was the Congress. They wanted to do it, made everybody happy. In New Jersey, by the way, age discrimination is even better than normal. Normally, it's, uh, you can't discriminate someone who's over the age of 40, which I consider extremely young. Uh, but in New Jersey, it's uh, at any age. So there's no cap on it. You can't discriminate against somebody who's 25 as opposed to 26. So all of that is kind of, I don't really understand the point of it, to tell you the truth. It, it's never been something that I thought was a high priority. 
So I'm, I'm dubious about it, but it's still an interesting question. I could be convinced. Um, anyway, so I think part of the problem with the, with the, with the issue it was brought up at lunch, and I think in the paper, it's not altogether clear why we care about this. What, what, is, why, what is the public policy issue other than uh, what I'll talk about in a second? Um, the other thing the paper does, which I like a lot, is it tries to lay out a sort of a research agenda. In other words, what are some subjects that we would probably be interested to learn about? And I, I think that's, it's a great idea to bring those subjects up. I, I'm not sure how far you can get with them is the only trouble. So for example, are um, older workers paid more than their productivity? Well, there's a very unfortunate aspect to that, even asking that question that way. This discussion of this model that Eddie Lazier is well known for, which kind of rationalizes mandatory retirement, is really based on an older paper by Becker and Stiegler, which is about uh, how, do you, how should you compensate police officers or people in whom you want to uh, endow trust. It's kind of riff on the Adam Smith problem. And the basic idea of the paper is that what you want to do is you want to fix it so that people are overpaid. That way, when they get fired, they'll be really unhappy. And of course, in order to get your money back, you've got to bond them at the end of the life cycle. But another alternative to that is to underpay them when they're in the period when you think they're key, and then, and then to overpay them. That's the way you get, them, get their money back to them uh, when they're older. So uh, when it, it's, it kind of is a, another way to get at that same issue of trying to find a trust bond. And of course, if you do that, then mandatory retirement is desirable because then you can get rid of the guys at some point, understand, everybody understands in, in advance what it is. In other words, it's, it's mandated, but everybody knows what it is. So they all read out a contract that we can all understand. Um, the difficulty, of course, is that a lot, once you reach the point where the, where the worker is overpaid relative to their productivity, which is a part of the contract, it's a natural part of the life cycle, it's supposed to be like that, of course, the employer wants to renege. If you, if you can fire the guy and avoid the contract, you would, and I've always thought that was one. In fact, Eddie himself, Lazier, thinks that's one argument for an AIDS Discrimination Act, is that to, buy, to get around this fact that people might try to violate these, these contracts. But you can see right away by my describing this, is, and, and Bob did a very nice job of talking about this too, this is a really complicated problem. It's not altogether clear what meaning there is to this issue. I mean, it could be that long-term contracts are designed. It wouldn't surprise you. In fact, I was just talking to Bob at the break. Uh, apparently, uh, pensions in, in public jobs go back a long way. Maybe not in private jobs, but in public ones. Which might make some sense if you're worried about trust, and if this kind of contract was what people were doing. So it's a, that's a complicated problem to work on. Very difficult. Uh, I think it's, it's definitely worth trying to find out what it's done. And Bob gives a few examples. The Japanese changes in mandatory retirement. A lot, very little has been done with this topic. So I think it is a good subject. In other words, uh, when we eliminated mandatory retirement, did, did it actually tilt age earnings profiles? I don't think there's any work in the US at all on this. Um, I did some work early on with academics, because the academics had, were immune from that for, for, for a while. Uh, and then they, they got changed. But I don't think we ever really tried to figure out anything about we, we were more interested in the retirement than the other side. Um, so that's one example of something he's talked about. Are young and old substitutable? Well, you can see that's a related question. So that's a very similar question. And I think that the, the issue of um, you know, hierarchies, the, the problem with thinking about hierarchies from the point of view of an economist is, think of some state-old organization like Princeton. I'll use that instead of Stanford because Princeton's a very state-old organization. Um, it, it presumably has some structure, departments and so on. Um, and, uh, and there, or we can even think of other state-old organizations, like Microsoft is getting to be like that a little. Um, these organizations are structured in such a way that they're not going to grow. They're stuck. And by definition, more or less, they have some hierarchical structure which has worked for them in the past. It may not be the one for the future, but it's worked for them in the past. So kind of by definition, uh, if you have a lot of people in, that are older filling up those jobs, there won't be as many for the younger ones. But that's not, that isn't really talking about the economics of the problem, because that's just one company. So I understand that's a problem in some companies, and they have to try to cope with it. But it doesn't really tell us anything about what the, what, what we should, how we should think about uh, 
what an optimal, what, a, what an aid structure does to the economy otherwise. So I think that's another very complicated subject, which I think is important. To, some other ones are easy to research, like health costs and, and age. I mean, there's a very interesting example. The big, the big organizations that are self-insured, it would be quite interesting, I think, to see just how much more, it, it, what, how the age structure changes the structure of their health costs. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that. But that could be done very easily, I mean, by looking at individual institutions and trying to stratify them. So that's a very, I think that's an interesting subject. Um, finally, let me, let me turn to a, a, in this conference, I think, um, there are several things left off, I think, of Bob's list, which I think would be helpful to try to, he, he mentioned them, but they're not really mentioned as part of the research agenda. Um, what are they? Well, I, I think they're the puzzles. In fact, I think if anything, to make this, to make the idea of uh, studying geezers more interesting, I think maybe presenting it as a study of research puzzles would make it more attractive to economists generally. Uh, I mean, younger economists. <laughs> <laughs> they, they like puzzles. You know, you would, would explain, you know, the equity premium puzzle or something, make up a puzzle. So we actually have quite a few puzzles here. Um, one of them is not a puzzle to economists, but it's a puzzle to other people, and Bert let's mention it, which is that um, working longer doesn't really do anything to resolve the, the, uh, the ultimate shortfall in what we've promised uh, pension, uh, pensions to be like in uh, 20 or 30 years from now and what our tax rates currently are. Uh, and that's, so that's kind of a more of a PR deal. I think all that involves is you just have to find a way you can research that problem. And it's a surprise, I think, to most people. Shocking, in fact, but it really doesn't solve that problem at all. And probably, maybe packaging that right could be a really good research, a little research agenda, because it, it's not going it, to. It kind of goes against the grain, I think, of this research project here. But I think it's actually a very important point that people need to be more aware of, because we'll never grapple with this issue if we try to take the easy way out. That, this is my interpretation: is getting people to work longer. That's the easy way out, because the government has to do anything. We just can all sit on our hands and say, "No problem, no problem." A real work longer. So that, in a way, I think that's important to get that out of the way. The second one, which I think is a real puzzle, and, and um, Heard made some comments about this because he really constructed it. He constructed the puzzle, which is that um, from what we can, from what I can see, for example, looking across countries, developed countries, um, in uh, the paper that uh, Milgan and, Will and uh, Wise did, um, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that increased longevity has actually led people to work more. So what seems to have been happening over the longer haul is that the length of, the way people are taking extra leisure from the fact that they're wealthier is at the end of their lives. We haven't had much decline in work hours now since the, around 1950. So we're kind of stuck at the regular work hours and what seems to be happening is the way people take their leisure is at the end of their lives from this higher wealth. Um, but I, I say that because I looked at that picture. I, I was a little bit surprised by that picture, by the way. Um, but it's, it is, I think, a puzzle, the natural puzzle, why it is that um, the increased longevity has had so little effect uh, on, uh, well, in fact, maybe even gone the other way. Uh, then you could think of a model in which you could, that you could construct that might explain that. And you could think of cross-national variability. Um, one of the papers you try to use state variability. I must admit, it never occurred to me that cross-state variability might actually have something to do with any of this. But it's certainly another source of much better data that you could measure at a very fine level. So that, that's a puzzle. Uh, and I think, you, I don't know, you have to, you know, a good puzzle always has to have a good name. Uh, and uh, the equity premium puzzle, I always love that, because you don't quite know what it means, and then when you hear what it is, you're kind of excited about it. Of course, it went away. That's one of the beautiful things of the puzzle. Um, so this one, I'm not sure what to call this, but maybe the mortality life, mortality is a terrible word, though. Um, but anyway, the mortality uh, life cycle working age puzzle, which, which is probably worth, 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 worth a serious effort. <laughs> no good. Well, okay, I'm not into, I, I'm not a great namer, right, so that's, that's uh, we have to have a better name for it, you're right. <laughs> and then, uh, um, and then, of course, Chauvin has pointed out, I must admit, I, I was surprised by this uh, when he first told me, maybe because my behavior wasn't, wasn't was, was optimal, but um, this business about the, uh, 
the climbing rate. Um, so if you look at Bertolus's, he has a little picture there, which I kind of liked, of the, uh, the age at which uh, half the people, uh, it, the labor force rate is below 50%. And you can see that's budged that's like around 62, 63. I know claiming rates are basically around 62 for Social Security. It is kind of a puzzle. It, there, it, that falls into these anomalies that people have got. You know, why are credit card interest rates so high? Uh, why, why did uh, people take these very relatively small lump sums rather than extra pensions to leave the Army, the paper someone referred to by Warner and others? Uh, and that's another interesting thing. I think calling that a puzzle makes it more interesting. And, and I noticed that Chauvin's paper was t today was actually sort of went at it in that direction. But I said calling it a puzzle even better. Uh, finally, in this paper, there's, there are several mentions about what the government could do, and I haven't said much about this, and I won't say much, what, what the government could do to um, make the demand for older workers greater. Uh, and those are, those are thrown out as possibilities without actually claiming that anybody should do them, so I don't want to overstate what was being done. And they're, they're kind of, they're lovely, they're lovely suggestions, I must admit, I love them all. Like, uh, uh, no Social Security uh, taxes for uh, older people. <laughs> in other words, their employer would not pay his half and his or her half, and I wouldn't pay mine either. It all sounds good to me. Uh, I have to admit, I did, this struck me as being a pretty implausible uh, uh, suggestion. But uh, it certainly, if you wanted to increase demand, that falls into the category of uh, what would happen if you change the cost structure and would it increase demand. And I think if the research agenda of trying to measure the demand for older workers were engaged in, then you could actually calibrate and say what effect this would have, if any, on increasing the demand for older workers. Um, of course, it, there's supply side to this, right? So it might just drive up their wages. Uh, so that's another issue that would have to be addressed, I think, if you think about that. Flexible hours, that, that's a great idea. In fact, I think that's a more general issue, far more general than older people. Uh, California has gone some way on that. I'm not sure everybody knows this. There's a room for a natural, little natural experiment analysis here. Um, California, because of the wage and hours laws, it's not so easy to uh, engage in flexible wages and um, flexible hours. In other words, let's say you wanted to have uh, four days work for 10 hours. That, that's gonna cost you a lot of money. But the state of California permits employees on the workplace to vote and actually decide whether or not that will be okay and not violate the Fair Labor Standards Act. I don't know when that was adopted here. I've tried to get students to study that a little bit and see whether or not, I don't know how much data there is on it either. But there's actually room, a lot of room, I think, for the idea of studying flexibility, and it might be helpful. I think probably one of the reasons it would be helpful is because it would, it would but not just for older people, for lots of other people too. That's a great research topic, that if, if it could be motivated as a part of a, an agenda for studying older workers, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, and of course, there's the, the business about medical costs. So we've had several discussions of this, how the Affordable Care Act might be helpful. Uh, there are other, other uh, Medicare and, uh, arrangements can be made as well, and that's, I think that's pretty straightforward and easy to study. Anyway, so I enjoy reading this, uh, although I, I, uh, I, I must admit, I think Bob is a great presenter. Is anybody thinking about new roles, new work roles for that would suit the kinds of skills that older people have? So if you think about people today, 60 to 74, they're, as a population, very healthy, highly educated, uh, emotionally stable, um, have reared their kids. They, they don't have as many family sort of duties behind, you know, in, in, in the rest of their lives. And you could imagine creating roles in workplaces that would be suited for those particular skills. And they're very different, it's a very different set of qualities than you see in young workers. Um, not fast and, 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 you know, sort of motivated to, you know, uh, advance their own careers and so on. It'd be a, a separate kind of thing, but you could imagine different roles and that might make older workers seem appealing because those are some nice qualities. Yeah, no, I think uh, two things. It's sort of, you 
where I, one of the things I started with was what do older workers want to do in the way of work-life extension. So if an, uh, an older worker is willing to have flexible hours, get paid a little bit less, downgrade their level of responsibility, and stay with the same company, uh, I would think that the company would be more likely to want to retain that worker. Uh, the fundamental question is, is that what older workers want? Or do they want to stay on the same job with the same pay, even if they're less productive or whatever their skill set uh, has changed to? Uh, and so I think it does get back to not only changes in compensation, but changes in working conditions and levels of responsibility and everything else that, that goes with that. I mean, uh, just to my university example, if the senior professor would be willing to be a lecturer and just show up at, for, and just teach the class, do anything else they wanted to, they'd still have their office and whatever, their salary would be cut to a lecturer salary, then the university would probably be more likely to retain, be interested in retaining them. Uh, but is that what that senior professor wants? Uh, so that's our world. But the same thing I think would be true in many uh, businesses. Okay, uh, I have a lot of comments, but I'm just going to limit it to two. <laughs> um, uh, the first is that, um, thanks in part to the Sloan Foundation, um, there's, there actually has been a lot of uh, work on uh, the topics that uh, Orly Ashenfelter uh, was talking about since you know his uh, wonderful paper that I always cite about uh, college professors. Um, and uh, things, people that you can look at, um, uh, David Newmark has like a little cottage industry right now on uh, the Age Discrimination uh, and Employment Act. Um, he has a great paper with uh, Wendy Stock on um, uh, how the empirical effects of uh, mandatory retirement on uh, Lazier contracts. Um, uh, Lyra Friedberg has, uh, I don't think it's a published paper, but she has a pretty good paper looking at uh, how uh, wages are uh, adjusted with changes in health insurance costs. Um, Scott Adams has a fantastic uh, paper on the uh, Journal of Public Economics that looks at what happens when um, health insurance uh, costs uh, drop for older workers, their wages go up. Um, I have a Sloan-founded paper that never did get published, but um, that, that looks at uh, um, mandates that make younger workers uh, cost more, um, and it finds that uh, uh, older workers are uh, le uh, are discriminated against, but not discriminated against any more than any other worker that costs uh, uh, more money. Um, and uh, so that's that's the first comment. And uh, the second comment is. Um, uh, so my advisor was Josh, one of my advisors was Josh Angrist, and uh, he's a labor economist. And when I was working on this age discrimination question, I kept getting exactly the same um, feedback from, you know, Josh Angrist and David Otter and all of the labor economists. And they'd say, why do we care about age discrimination? Age discrimination isn't important. You can plan for it. Everybody gets old. It's not like race where uh, you, you might see these dynamic feedback effects and so on. Um, but from the public finance side, um, you know, people thought this was a natural question to ask. And I think part of the reason that there hasn't been as much uh, work on this is because from labor, econ uh, this really is a labor economics question, but the people who are interested in it are actually the public finance um, uh, folks. And um, I think what I would say to try to convince people that this may actually be important is that whenever you have statistical discrimination, um, it, it, I think we actually should care about the people who are on the edges of that, you know, statistical discrimination um, uh, line, the people who are, you know, more qualified than average and the people who are less qualified than average. And we might actually care what happens to them uh, individually rather than just focusing on what the average is. So that's in addition to all these public uh, policy questions that uh, the public finance people are so uh, concerned about, you know, how do we deal with social security and things like that. I agree with Orley um, that uh, since the late 1940s here in the United States, uh, the way that uh, people seem to prefer to take extra leisure is at the end of life. And so uh, almost any analysis would show we've added an awful lot of non-working years at the end of life because of rising uh, 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 retirement and uh, rising lifespans. 
But I do want to offer a little correction to what Orly said about the long-term history of how, about how much people work. I know this is a result that I remember from my undergraduate years, learned in anthropology, so it might be wrong. <laughs> but the move from hunter-gathering societies to agricultural societies actually was linked to an increase in work hours, not to a reduction. Hunter-gatherers apparently, these anthropologists going around following them, they don't work as much as you would think they do because it actually doesn't take all that long to get as long as, as there's re reasonably good climate and, uh, uh, and weather. You know, occasionally it's really tough on them and lots of them die off from starvation, but in most years they don't work as much. This move to agriculture actually was an increase in work hours. And uh, this second fact I learned when I imprudently published an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal a number of years ago in which I defended uh, the laissez-faire attitude in the United States toward how long the work week should be. Juliet Shore, who I think at the time was a professor of sociology at uh, Harvard, wrote me a letter and said, you know, I'm looking at the history of work hours from the point of view of industrial workers starting in the second half of the 19th century, but that was the longest work effort in all of human history. So the Chinese today working in these apple factories are actually working more than Chinese peasants worked. Now they might have a more enjoyable life, it may be more material rewards, but they are actually working longer than agriculturalists in China work. And that her point was that by starting the clock from the kind of work, industrial work, when you can have lights inside the factory so that you can work really, really long hours every single month of the year. And when she said this, I come from a farm, it's exactly right. During the season uh, of farming, there's a lot of seasons, you just can't do much. You know, you can't, there's nothing you can do. It's, it's uh, too dark to work outside. It's, uh, you know, the winter prevents you from doing anything useful. So in fact, uh, the, over the course of a year, people actually work less in agriculture than they do in these industrial jobs at the end of the 19th century. Um, this is just a comment on something that Orly and Gary just said about uh, people prefer to take their leisure at the end of their life. Um, and I just throw this out as a comment because there's no structure for this yet. But with the rise of two-parent households and the fact that people are living longer, what I, what I have seen is that people would rather work longer and reclaim, quote, some leisure mid-career where they would actually have the capacity in terms of time and resources to spend with their children. Because uh, we funded a very extensive program on working families and the, one of the biggest conclusions, at least for middle class families, was the, the fact that there was a, a, a severe time scarcity that they felt simply that they did not have enough time for work and for family. So I think that, you know, the, the market has basically legitimized and financially, um, and the government financially supports people taking, quote, leisure at their end of their life. But in reality, if people are working longer, I think they would, in many cases, prefer to reclaim some of that time in the, their midlife, but there's no mechanism for supporting that. Okay, I'm going to give Bob one last word. Okay, uh, just a, cu a couple of quick points. Um, you know, in, in lots of ways, the lengthening retirement period should be considered a great success for our society. I mean, people have the wealth, they can have a retirement period. And uh, you know, so I'm certainly not an advocate of giving that away, uh, but I am certainly an advocate of people making decisions uh, to maximize their lifetime utility. Uh, and as you think about that, then. Um, you know, another issue that uh, Orly raised a little bit was just, you know, how do you measure productivity, I think, is, is certainly a question. And if you look at the older gerontological literature, people actually tried to count what people did. Uh, and they did that based on age. And there were some old studies, if you go back 20, 30 years ago, on things like that. Uh, but uh, more recently, even though we have greater access to data and all of the things, it's sort of harder to measure productivity, I guess. But we don't have those kinds of studies. In the paper, I cite a few. Uh, whether you can decide whether they're good studies or not. And then the final point on um, uh, Romans. Uh, so 
uh, Orly says he's been looking at Romans, and if you go back in history, uh, pensions go way back, including the Romans, and so if you look at the Roman Caesars, what did they do? They raised big armies, and they went out and they fought these wars, and then they'd come back, and there are these armies with them. And so what did they want to do? Did they want those armies worrying about bread or not? And so they pensioned them off, and oftentimes they pensioned them by giving them land, but the land was way out there, so you're not threatening me right here in, in, uh, in Rome. And you know, if you just fast forward over history, the history of pension development is the first people that get pensions are the army because the political groups are worried about them. And the second group that gets pensions are the politicians and the government service workers themselves. And then only the third uh, group is sort of the industrialized elite. And then finally, maybe it uh, gets out to the, the rest of the population. So uh, there's a long history to look at in pensions. And if you're looking at uh, Roman wage gains, look at, uh, for the army anyway, what they got during those wars.